Okay, remember the guy Bartolome and Philip that met one each other and Jesus arrived to the area of Kapakena and they were mocking Nazareth because Kapakena, this place, was much larger than Nazareth. And Nazareth was a small village. Nobody considered this place as a very big uh, village. And these two guys were gossiping behind his back. And Jesus says, I heard you and I saw you behind the fig trees. Remember this? Uh, so this is Bartolome house and traditionally they say that this is the site and when you look at the sign you see that this is Saint Bartolome that he was uh, met uh, Philip and Gasset behind uh, his back. But what I wanted you to see, many churches in Israel are having this rosette. Do you see the rosette in the center? Many of these churches were built say in the last 150, 220, 200 years like Ottoman authority, Ottoman periods. During the Ottomans, Ottomans were building houses, the houses was much higher, the, the, the floor was much higher than normal uh, floor today. When you look backwards, for example, you see this building, you see that uh, you see the floor with the white stones, and then above it you see the, uh, the gray, which is only cement, not filled yet with the plaster or with the uh, stone, right? You see, it's not so high as the floor from here up to the line up there. It's one floor, guys. It's like, say, now one and a half almost, even a little bit more than one and a half as a floor. Ottoman were building very high as a floor, as one floor. And to cool the place, they put rosettes like this on the top and on the other side also. And the wind was crossing through these rosettes and cooling the... Uh, the building. This is a system that you see rosettes, and you will see it in many of the places. So it's just air condition of 200 years back. Let's go. <laughs> This is the, uh, what it says, and you see why I ask you to look at the Hebrew at the uh, floor there, showing you that this is what we found, that this place was synagogue. And what it says, thanks to this person who gave us money to build up a synagogue, always, you know, things like this. So this is actually what it says there on the news. Let's go down and see where was the uh, waiting place. Just a second. These ruins are actually time of Jesus. Time of Jesus, it's Roman period. Roman period started at 63 BCE to 324 AD. Always, always Christianity stuff or places or monasteries or, uh, or uh, churches or any of the uh, symbol of Christianity started by 324 by Queen Helena. I wanted to talk about it later on, but okay, now we start. <coughs> Queen Helena was the one to come 300 years after <coughs> Jesus was crucified and asking questions, people that live in the area, where was the wedding? Where was the place he was working on the water? Where was the place he multiplied uh, fish and, uh, and bread to the people, wherever? Where was any of these things that he was doing? Where can I find the cross? So all these traditional stories started at 4th century AD. So guys, some places we go in, it's not any of the evidence telling us that this place is the right place. But traditionally, we're not breaking no one tradition. Okay, here especially, this place shows you, and this is why I ask you, look at the ground and see. Because it's a synagogue. And we believe that this was the place, because in the synagogue we do weddings. So this was the place where was the wedding. 
But in some other places, when we arrive, I'll tell you, okay, to be honest with you, 1,000% we're not sure that this is a place. 900% maybe. Okay? So it's sometimes, you know, places destroy and rebuild, destroy and rebuild many times in history. And I'll talk about the periods, who come and destroy, who rebuild, and when. So it's confusing. I don't want on the first day to fill you with a lot of information. In the end of the day, you're confused. But this will be the uh, stories in places. So this, this something here, it's like uh, because of the wine, and to say that the jar of wine, this is where they press the wine in. And you, when you look at the circle, you can press, and the wine goes into the jar like. Mm -hmm. That's the idea showing you that this is how they make wine. By the way, it talks about the sixth jar of wine. The addition is saying, that these six found here in this area are in Köln in Germany. And in one of the churches in Köln in Germany, they show you six jars made out of clay. But guys, many things made out of clay, and you can imitate <laughs> clay of uh, 2,000 years old easily. I mean, so to tell you the truth, this is another thing that I can't tell you if it's true or not. But this is what they say. And why they say so? Because of the reason that the guy that built up this place is a Franciscan uh, priest. And you saw the other guys are Franciscan, I don't want them to hear. He is a Franciscan priest who built this church and he maybe found some jar here. And everywhere you go, you will find jar. But they say that they found the sixth jar. <laughs> everywhere you go, you will find thousand jars. And you will find the uh, soup bowls and dishes and cups and whatever made out of clay because this is what these guys use those days okay so respect them let's go up and see more. look now it's money What's the time to time it's more and more money look at the notes money stuff like this it's something that was not popular two three years ago so it's kind of ruined so jesus, yeah, yeah. jesus would have been living in Capernaum area right yeah, he was doing his so ministry in there. Order he, to, he was living in so Nazareth. Have moved to, uh, How long a walk would there have been from Capernaum to, to here? From, not from uh, Capernaum to here? Yeah. Where he would I would say two days. Uh, right, the really? camel, so, uh, donkey. Those days the transportation was camel, elephant, donkey, horses, wagons. Hmm. So uh, something like two days, because uh, you do in a day, you do 10 kilometers, so it's like a six miles you do in a day. Mm -hmm. Walking, if you walk. So if you're on a donkey, you do even a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Then when Jesus would have done a miracle of the, the wine. Which is the first miracle. Which is the first miracle. Now, now of course it would have been amazing. I mean, people have been like, what in the world? But I mean, did they really understand what was going on here? I mean, to, to really want, go, we need want, to remember this place because this guy is doing this miracle. You want to hear what I think about it? Maybe I'm not allowed to tell you. Okay, I'll tell you something. Guys, uh, not to offend no one, but look, when you have a jar made out of clay, say this size of a jar, you have in the jar for two years, not more than two years even, okay? Red wine, okay? And you keep wine for quite long time. You empty the jar, and you put water in the jar. You shake the water inside the jar and you pull the water out of the jar. What happened to the water? What color the water comes out? <laughs> Even the flavor of the wine still there. So the water will have flavor of wine. People that finish six jar of wine are drunk. If you give them petrol to drink, it will be good wine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true or not? It's logic or not? So, it's logical, I mean, it's, yes. it's logical. Okay. So, it's like the story that when he came out of the Last Supper, from the upper room, they drink wine. On Passover, we drink minimum four cups of wine. Right? So, they were dizzy. They were... A little bit uh, drunk, say. So he asked them, please, guys, I want to take a little nap and pray for me, and I want to pray. And they fall asleep, because they drink a lot of wine, remember? And then Judas Iscariot arrived to the place. I'm talking about the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was actually handed by Judas Iscariot 
to the uh, woman. So it's also the story of wine. Because these guys were drinking a lot of wine. I mean, you see the logic of the things. Maybe it's answering your question. <laughs> that's that's what you think. <laughs> don't no, say no, that. no, I said I said no no, I said don't take I appreciate everything of uh, done with this guy with Jesus, of course. Yeah. But I'm saying that look sometime on the other side, maybe there is another explanation mm -hmm. to what happened those days. Mm -hmm. And we are you know, leading to believe and to understand one way, but sometimes you can open it, it's like a shell, that you open the shell and there are many layers. You open the layers and you find that in this layer you have another color and another color, and each color is a different explanation mm -hmm. to the source. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I'm uh, not expressing myself right, but this is the idea behind you. When you think of something, think what could be the other things to make these things as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Think forwards, and this is what Jesus was doing. By the way, I always say, this is something that I'm allowing myself. Jesus was the first reformator in the Jewish history. He was a reformed Jew. And today we have Orthodox, which at the Orthodox we have ultra-Orthodox, we have conservative, and we have reformed Jew. The reformed Jew is not accepted by the uh, Orthodox. You know, Jewish wedding, reformed Jewish wedding is not accepted by Jewish uh, Orthodox. And there is a big argument until today about it, when we talk about weddings. I don't know if you know this. Because the, the reform movement in the Jewish sect are not accepted by the um, Orthodox. Okay? And Jesus was one of the guys who look forwards and not backwards. And one of the examples is that when he breaks Shabbat, he says to these guys, you also sometimes breaking Shabbat and do things like, but nobody complain because the people are afraid from you guys. I'm not afraid from you guys. That's what he was saying to them. I mean, if you think about it simply, I'm when, not afraid from you guys. When Jesus said, you know, for example, when they were walking through and they were picking grain and the, the Pharisees were all upset about that, yeah. technically there's nothing in the Old Testament to go against picking grain. There is against putting a, a sickle to it, but I don't see that they were the necessarily breaking is, Sabbath. It was the No, the Pharisees only thing it was like saying, it was saying, it was saying that when God created the uh, old world, he created it in the seven days, and he says, on the day of Sabbath, the seven, you rest from all of what you do during the week. So what do you do during the week? During the week, you're working in a farm, you're working there, you're driving, you're working, you're going. And by the way, this is something which also we call a rov. Maybe you know it, maybe not. I'll talk about it later. I'll show you what I'm talking about. But I won't get into this subject now. But the idea is, the idea is that you have to rest from all what you do during the week. What are you doing during the week? You're a farmer, right? So when you farm here, you're picking up fruit, and uh, if you're cooking at home, the wife cooks. You're not allowed to cook on Shabbat, right? You're not putting fire to cook, things like this. And these guys, anyway, as far as I uh, believe, were looking for excuses to knock him down. They did not like this person. This person, in the age of 12 years old, like in her age, he was already argue with these guys in the temple. When his mother saw that he is with the father, and the father saw that he is with the mother, he was home alone in the temple. Remember the movie Home Alone? He was left it in the temple. Because the mother saw that he is with the father, the father thought that he is with the mother. In the meantime, the boy was arguing with rabbis at the temple in Jerusalem. And they found out only after a few hours that he's not with them. Okay. So it shows you that this guy was already then like a pain in the, in the neck for these guys, okay? They did not like someone, and especially young, to come and tell me how to do what I'm doing. Like, nobody, like no boss, like that uh, his worker will tell him how to do things. Mm -hmm. Okay, take it, I mean, one, one of the things to think about this guy. And he created jealousy around himself. Because some places he, he cured people. He did cure people, right? Yeah. It's create jealousy. I'm a high priest. I 
can't help a person, daughter, uh, fever, or dead, real life. Eh? And I'm a higher priest. Everyone look at me like I'm number one. And a guy like from the States come and he cured her and he continue to go, doesn't talk about it even. Does not make out of it big deal that he is uh, curing people. Okay, so you, you know what I mean? This is actually the uh, story behind what this guy created uh, on his back. I think that it's all jealousy. But they still had respect for him, though, didn't they? Because, I mean, they, come, they call him rabbi, not. teacher, so... Okay, but they... who was respecting him? Few guys. Calvin. The other, yeah. The other did not. And the jealousy that he created around him created a problem. Mm -hmm. Not many people liked it. Think about it that you are uh, having a factory, you have uh, 100 people working for you, and one of the guys that just yesterday uh, stopped work for you come and tells you, you know what, I think you're wrong, you do wrong things, you should do this way, like this way, and you should do this like this way. And you say, hey, excuse me, when did you start working for me? He says, yesterday. Okay, you filed. It's exactly the same. Okay, I mean, think about this way. here was built over the ruins of the uh, house of Mary and uh, of course we are in Nazareth guys because sometimes people ask me where are we so this is Nazareth and uh, this beautiful huge complex a nice piece of uh, church is looking at built in 1965 over the ruins that the very beginning is uh, actually Roman periods, time of Jesus, time of the family. Then, Queen Elena, mother of Constantinus, was a mistress of Const Constantinus I, and she was not his uh, wife. And then she titled herself, and I'll tell you about it later, um, she titled herself as a queen. And uh, later on, her son, Constantinus, became the ruler when he became the ruler the mother says look i want to go to the uh, land of israel where this person uh, this rabbi was doing all kind of different miracle i want to do research about these things and i need your help and the son says mom don't worry i'll give you soldier i'll give you supply i'll give you transportation you guys go do your research do your your job there wherever you want and she came up to this land and start, as I told you before, asking where was the place Mary being announced, right? Where was the place he was multiplied, where he was converting water into wine, all these things. And people told her, I heard from my grand-grandpa that the place is there and there and there. And then she came up and she marked the places. Well, how you mark the place? She built a small monument. This small monument became a little monastery, 4th century AD, 6th century AD, it's Byzantine period. Roman period started by 63 BCE to 324. She arrived at 324 and brought with her the uh, Byzantine periods. Byzantine period started by 624 up to 638. During this period, there was a few differences in the uh, periods. I'll talk about it later. But just for you to understand, since this time, this lady marked all these sites which are holy for Christian today. And one of the sites she marked is this place which we're going to go inside to the church and we see the ruins in this place. And then ab above the ruins they built a small monument. 
at the 7th century, 638, Arab arrived to this area, what did this guy do? Destroy. They did not live in many of the places, they did not live places complete, and especially mosaic floor that Byzantine done. Beautiful places, in many of the places they ruined beautiful uh, mosaic floor. And then Crusader came at 1099. When Crusader arrived at 1099, they rebuilt the places that had been ruined by the Arab from 638 to 1099. Later on, Crusader had been kicked out by Muslim again, and we have second Muslim period started by 1291, all the way up to 1516 is the Mamluks, 15, uh, I mean 1516 to uh, 1918 is the Ottoman, the Turks, which is another Muslim. And you see how Muslim also fighting between themselves. Mamluk were Egyptian Muslim, taking over this area from 1291 to 1516. Turkish Muslim from Turkey, Egypt is there, Turkey is there, coming, taking over of what these guys conquered, kick them out of this area and control the place all the way up to uh, 1918, which is First World War, then we had the British taking over from 1918 to 1948, which is the British mandate. And then, during this time of the Ottoman periods, say at 1850 to 1870s, many of these churches been rebuilt, either by Russian Orthodox, which is actually Greek Orthodox money, and by Franciscan. Again, you look at the emblem and you know that this is Franciscan. You see the two hands and the uh, Franciscan cross, right? Mm -hmm. This place, the Annunciation place, was rebuilt over the ruin of the house of uh, Mary parents by money of many different countries all over the world. And this money was coming from the Franciscan uh, sect. The year was 1965, not long ago, I mean, 45 years ago. And you walk in and you'll see that this is a modern, you can see that it's a modern church. You walk in and you'll see the countries that donated money to build up the uh, church. So each one of this country, as you see outside here, had a mosaic with the picture of Mary in a different year. And you see even China, look how Mary look as Chinese. <laughs> my favorite one is the Japanese, and I'll show you inside why it's my favorite one when we go inside. One of the uh, unique thing, you look at the church, what they did here, they, the, uh, the, uh, the artist did something very nice. Here he did motive of New Testament, and at the door, as we walk in to the left, is motive from the Old Testament. Okay, the Annunciation Day is of course 25 March in a year, and if you remember that for the millennium the uh, Pope arrived to Israel. Remember that uh, during the millennium he was saying uh, it was 11 years ago, I will come on Christmas time. Then he says, no, no, I'll come on uh, January. Maybe I'll come on the Armenian Christmas uh, time, which is 19 January. Maybe I'll come here, maybe I'll come there. He was changing his um, dates. Do you know why he was changing the dates? We were very worried that when he'll come here, maybe terror activity. It was during the Intifada time. Maybe terror activity, maybe something uh, will, uh, someone will get uh, the pop or something like this will shoot or whatever. So we keep changing dates with him and we uh, actually convinced by him that he wants to come to Israel on the uh, Annunciation Day, which is 25th March. And he was here on the 25th March and the first place he stepped in to the Holy Land was here. This was the uh, place, okay? So let's walk into the church. Just look at the beautiful motives that you have.
So when you look at the picture, you understand Adam and Eve, Cain killing his brother, Rachel cry for the baby, then Noah collecting to his ark the animals, and then of course Abraham with the story of sacrifice and Isaac, allies with God, and you see the ram that we caught in the uh, in the wood, and then he takes the ram and <coughs> actually sacrifices the ram. So these are the biblical, these are the New Testament. Let's go into the church before these guys. <laughs> example guys come over here just a second look at this one of the example of seeing the process of this place come a bit closer you see Roman periods which is Jesus time is there Byzantine periods is this beautiful floor because Byzantine used a lot of uh, mosaic and then the crusader time, the crusader time is there, the wall here. This is, this wall is crusader time. So it shows you the process. Started as a small place, Roman periods down there. Byzantine periods enlarged to this area. Look at this area, one of the apses, look at the apses. And you see that you have on the plaster, you see some motives which this motive is Byzantine. You look at the floor, it's Byzantine. It's already 4th century. 1st century, 4th century, and 11th century is Crusader. The wall right here, okay? So already you see the process, how things, archaeology, been grown up with the dates. Well, as he said, uh, if you're just coming out here, these would be ruins from Nazareth. As you saw down below, if you didn't get to hear all of that, that those are actual ruins from the time of Jesus. We might call these different sites A, B, and C sites. Um, a being, we know this is the site. B being good possibility. C, you know, it, it's of the time period anyway. And so I would say C site uh, is all we have here. But at least it gives you some idea of what things looked like at that time. Um, and what we're dealing with here, you know, the, in case you're, you know, what's the Annunciation? Um, one thing that I'm just really thankful for is that our faith is not based on, you know, I come here and I see people coming and throwing money into places and that their faith is built on, built on tradition and ritual is all it is. And I think that's what's different about what I'm going to call true Christianity is it isn't built upon us coming here and seeing some holy site. This site means nothing, ultimately. It's neat for us to see these places, but what counts is that it says that God now lives in us, okay? Now, when I say this site, I mean the, the archaeological sites with their lessons, but I want you to understand that the land of Israel, that's a whole different issue. Well, we'll teach on that in other areas, but when it comes to these sites, our faith is not built in this. We don't need to see these things, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's good for us to see what maybe life was like in certain cases, um, but somewhere in this town, if you look around here and you can see on these hills, you can imagine that this is what Jesus would have seen, minus these homes, but he did had other homes that were built up on in, uh, the hills and in you can just imagine that if your eyeballs were his eyeballs, that he very well, I mean, he was looking up at that mountainside at some point. He, he'd have been seeing these things around you. And Mary would have seen these things. And you can just imagine at some point, Mary is in her home somewhere in this town. And the angel comes to her. And this is what uh, we see uh, happening. It says now, let me get to the right spot here. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came in unto her and said, 
Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this might be. And the angel said to, unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Emmanuel. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And it goes on where Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Wherefore also the holy thing which is begotten shall be called the Son of God. So, this was prophesied hundreds of years before it happened that Emmanuel would come. And uh, somewhere in this town, that's what happened that there were angels that appeared in a little lonely home in the quiet of, of somebody's bedroom, pretty much. We had that kind of miracle happening. And so I wanted you to be able to see Nazareth. Um, like I said, as far as the site itself, we'll call it a sea site. But at the same time, you're seeing things that are of that period. So that'll be it. I could see a conventional one, but you know, they're so concerned about the nuclear weapons that they're going to Well, they just going to blow this whole thing up and destroy everything. Watch the step, you guys. Okay, we did this stop because you know what? I said to myself, we'll do it quickly, but this is something that tourists are not visiting. I don't know why, because of the out of the way, because of uh, many other reasons that, you know, itinerary is too tough and too, uh, you know, busy, so not many people come to this place. This place is one of my favorite. So you guys lucky that you have me for this place. But yesterday I told you about the sect that anti-Zionist. Remember this sect? Satmer in New York. These guys are living in Jerusalem 
And this place is Necropolis. Necropolis is a city of death, right? And all these sarcophagus that you see here, what is the purpose of this sarcophagus? It's a guy that when he died, he, he wants to be buried in a, in a sarcophagus. There was many different systems in the 6,000 years back until today that you have a burial uh, system. One of the system is sarcophagus. And when you have sarcophagus, you have them made out of stone like this, which is a local stone, made out of lead, lead, you know, the metal, made out of wood, made out of clay. This is what we found in this area. But basically, most of the sarcophagus made by stone, and you will see that these sarcophagus are decorated. Why it's decorated? Guilt. Guilt is money. The guy is rich, and if he is rich, he wants to have something decorated. And I'll show you one of the richest guys how he uh, decorated his, uh, his uh, sarcophagus. But I'll go back to this menorah. And this is menorah. And there is a two types of menorah. One is menorah, one of is Hanukkah. Menorah is seven candles. Hanukkah is nine, which is another arch. What is the Hanukkah? Hanukkah, your doctors told me about it, that you guys lighting candles in Hanukkah. Hanukkah, Hanukkah is the Hanukkah feast when Judea and the Maccabee actually defeated the Greek out of this area. So it's your time, Christmas time, is the same time here, is the day we celebrate Hanukkah. Menorah, it was the light in the uh, temple, okay, that stole by Titus in the second temple. When he destroyed in the year 70 the second temple, he stole it, one of the treasures. The guy that stole the first menorah was Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BCE, during first temple. And I'll talk about the, the first and second temple periods, okay? So this is the menorah. And if you pay attention, you see that this part here, renovated. This part renovated, here it's renovated, here it's renovated, here, also here and here. And here we had something like this. Up to 20 years ago it was like this. One, two, three. I mean two steps on both sides of this menorah. Who damaged this menorah? Satmer, Jewish people. They came with ox, they came as tourists, these guys wearing a uh, yaki. Yaki is like a long uh, jacket. Under their uh, jackets they had ox and with the ox they came and damaged this beautiful menorah. I remember this menorah complete, real beautiful. This was the original part. This is original parts all the way up to here. This is original part. You see? You can tell also by the, uh, by the uh, erosion, by the uh, green, because of the humids. Now you can tell also how many times I was in this place. You see the scratch? Why I'm scratching each time I'm here? You see? Showing you that this is a soft chalk and you can easily build this place and hide under the uh, Roman. This place was very beginning, one of the places that we did hide from the Roman, and especially from this guy, Adrian, I was telling you about in 135. And then later on, Rabbi Yudanasi came and lived in this place. When he came and lived in this place, he rebuilt the place and made the place as Necropolis. He was saying to the Jewish who are living in, in the diaspora, he says, your soul will crawl under the ground to come to the Holy Land when you guys died. That's what he was saying to the Jewish people in the diaspora, saying what was his hint like? He wanted you to be here and not there in the diaspora. He wanted the Jew to be in Israel, that the Jews will collect it from the four wings of the whole world to the state of Israel, to the area of Israel. By the way, religious people, they go with four streams. Did you see them going with the four streams? It's also to collect you from the four corners of the world to this place. Okay, I want to show you another thing and let's go to the other room. Okay guys, so what we have here, it's one of the nicest one. And look at the decoration. 
Of course, when we see such a beautiful sarcophagus like this, we know that the person is rich. Because who prepared this uh, thing? It's an artist, that a guy, a rich guy, going to an artist and say, you do me a favor, make me a sarcophagus, this is my size. And he makes uh, the sarcophagus along the size of the person. And he says, I want to have in the decoration this and this and this and this and wherever, okay? But one of the things, it's showing you at the year 220 to, uh, say, 250 AD, that we follow suddenly the Greek mythology. Hellenistic period started in this area at 332 BCE, ended by 638. How many years? Thousand years almost. That main language was Greek. Jewish people follow the Greek mythology. Jewish people follow the Greek culture and the Greek artist. And this is part of the Greek artist. And you guys don't know even, you have the shell, the company, the gas company in the state shell. This is the emblem. I, I don't know if you, you knew it or not, but this is the uh, gas company. And we used to have up to 55 in Israel, the company shell. Today it's the yellow one that you see triangle. Any gas station yellow that you see says Paz, P-A-Z, is what was Shell at up to 55. This company bought it from the Shell company. So Shell company actually imitated the name and the Shell from the Greek mythology. So look how things is uh, funny. Okay, how many people here are left hand? One, two. Let's say five, okay? <laughs> Look at this. Okay, just turn around here. Look at this. You see, this is ancient Hebrew. This is a old Hebrew. You see the word shalom. You see the shin, lamed, vav, and mem, shalom, okay? He is resting here in peace. Shalom is in peace, okay? Why Hebrew written from right to left? Do you have any idea? Put the lights on me. I'll tell you. He is left hand, right? So now, Majority of us is right hand. Right hand. The power is right, right hand. You Hebrew, ancient Hebrew was written by nail. We call it the Ktavia Tedot, nail written. So you was holding the nail with your left hand, but the power to hit the nail is the right. right. Mm -hmm. So you go from here. Because you write and you do mem, you do lamed, you do c, a, b, whatever <laughs> of the letters. You go from right to left. Y is. It's another F16 to go. Y is uh, uh, Latin and other languages started after, uh, say, uh, uh, four, four, five century AD, coming also with the ink and stuff like this, going from left to right that you won't smash the paper. That's easily the, 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 the only uh, reason. So, Hebrew, Arabic imitate the Hebrew, of course, so they also go from right to left. But Latin language, Greek, goes from left to uh, right, okay? I'll show you another thing about the written. Let's go to the other uh, place. Let's go out, guys. Hello. Okay, I want you to be here, I want you to be here, but uh, as many of you, I want to show you something here that you will learn about this picture here. Come over here, guys. Are we all here, guys? Necropolis, yeah. Necropolis is the city of the... Necropolis. Yeah, I told you that the yeah, mythology, right. and suddenly we became uh, following a Greek mythology. Okay, this animal, you guys know what is this animal? It's the face of a bull. A bull, right? A bull in Hebrew is aluf. Aluf. The first letter in Hebrew is? But in Hebrew, Aleph. Aleph. Aleph came from the word aluf. And now how the Hebrew letter Aleph look like? If you go by the script one, it goes like this. Up an arch like this and a line here. And now it comes out of the aluf. How it comes out of the aluf, look at this. Horn coming down above the eyes and connecting to the other horn. So this is the line like this. 
okay? And then ear, eye, eye, ear is the straight line, comes here. So this is Aleph script. But the uh, regular Aleph, it's like this. One, <coughs> two, and three, like this. This is Aleph. So if you take the face of the Aluf, 45 degrees, you get something like this. One, two, three. But if you turn it another 45 degree, what do you get, guys? A. You guys um, imitate the A from the Aleph Hebrew. <laughs> Simple. Huh? So, look at this rich guy. And what showing you in this sarcophagus that this guy is not only rich, he is politically person, uh, hyper person or something like this. He chose the behemoth king is the bull. Behemoth is the, um, is the uh, cows and the, and the uh, veals and all these type of animals. So the, their king is the bull. Then the eagle is the kings of the birds. The lion on both sides is kings of animals. You see the lions? Look like cats, but it's a lion. You see the lions? So lion is the, is the animal uh, king, right? So look at the eagle which is the birds. And now look at his wife. <laughs> Funny, huh? Aww. How snub is this person? <laughs> and here you see the hole that, thanks God, the Bedouins and the Arab who damaged this sarcophagus, left it beautiful and made a window here to look if the treasure is inside. Of course, they didn't find nothing. What they found, maybe it's powder. That's his wife. That's okay. His wife. So what happened to the bodies? I mean, did, this was every with years. With the years, body disappeared. With the years, body been uh, Okay. So this was used at one time. Of course. Okay. All the sarcophagus that you saw are used. <laughs> the only guy, the only guy that buried in the ground, under the ground, is the Rabbi Yudanasi, who asked to be buried in the ground. He says, "I came from the ashes, and we go back to ashes." This is what we do today. Today we bury it under the ground, and of course we build a tombstone above. But the body is below the, the level of the ground. Let's go stretch sometimes, you know, to talk about the aluf and the elif being made. But when you look at ancient Hebrew, they are connected to that, and they even tell a story, much like what we see in China today. Some of the Chinese letters and words have meanings to like the flood for example um, or uh, the word for I think it's deceive or something I'd have to look in my notes again for uh, Chinese has the reference to uh, a snake basically deceiving something it goes back to the Garden of Eden and the same is true with Hebrew words the the ancient Hebrew words there is meaning to that so some of the very words that we have in Hebrew the word itself will go back to a meaning, and I'll share later some of those aspects for faith and repentance and salvation and things like that, that they are connected to that, so it isn't something, it's not a far stretch at all. So just to give an example of what uh, Mr. Brian is saying is, say for example, this is the aluf, is the A. So the B is a house. It's a square with a roof. Beit, a house. A house is bait. So bait is a house. In Hebrew, that's in Hebrew. It is, so bad, it's, like it's a shape there. of a house. Okay, let's go to the bus.
but one of the things I wanted to talk about, if you recall, we were just at that uh, Church of the Annunciation, and we were leaving, and I don't know if you saw it, but as you left, there was a statue of Mary there. And Mary <coughs> was standing on a snake, a serpent. Her foot was crushing the head of this serpent. That's often common within in the Catholic Church because they see Mary as basically being sinless and whatnot. Now we know that that was Jesus, that it was a prophecy right there in Genesis chapter 3 that says that the Messiah, Jesus, would crush the head of Satan. But what we had... He's, I'll just keep going here. He's, yeah. Yeah, we, we saw it. But what you're going to see is that they have... Jesus is the one that is going to crush the head, but they often have Mary doing that very thing. And so it, it just takes away what Christ has done for us, and it puts it on Mary. And so I don't know if you saw that or not, but we'll have some pictures later of it. But what I want to talk about with that is that ultimately this has become idol worship in the church. There, there's all this kind of idol worship, and Mary has become that idol for, for many of the Catholics. They worship Mary. Well, if you saw some of those things at the Church of the Annunciation, the pictures, and you might have even seen Mary and baby Jesus, well, many of those oftentimes that you will see within uh, Catholicism, even in the Lutheran Church many times, or even other denominations, aren't even pictures of Mary and Jesus, but it's actually pagan symbols that were Christianized. Um, you won't be able to see it here, but on the bus I can show you later uh, a picture of uh, Samaranus, who basically, the, as the story goes, uh, not necessarily scripturally, but tradition in, in Babylonian, um, I guess, history, is you, you know Shem is certainly a biblical character. He supposedly, according to tradition, killed Nimrod. Nimrod, we know, was centered kind of at the Tower of Babel in that area. Well, he had a wife named Samaranus, uh, also called Beltus, who became pregnant by the rays of the sun. A okay, good excuse. I don't think I'd accept that if my daughter came home. But anyway, <laughs> supposedly, she gave birth on December 25th. And, of course, it was the rays of the sun. Well, um, Nimrod was actually killed by a wild boar. And so what happened is his wife apparently got pregnant with somebody else and said, well, it's Nimrod who has ascended, it is now the sun, and has impregnated me. And so the child became known then uh, there as uh, Tammuz. Well, Tammuz was, I'm sorry, it was Tammuz who was killed by a wild boar. Tammuz later, when he was 40 years old, was killed by a wild boar. And this is one reason why, believe it or not, that we eat pork, uh, ham, on Easter. Because, yeah, why does everybody eat ham on Easter? Well, it has to do with this tradition of the wild boar who had killed Tammuz. And so what we see oftentimes in the picture is this um, Samaranus, the mother, who is represented as Mary, holding baby Tammuz. And so in archaeology we find these all over and it even tells us this is Tammuz, this is Samaranus, and what they've done is they've taken those pictures and they now use them in the church. And so oftentimes you will see the picture here that I can show you on the bus when you can actually see a little bit better uh, when there's light. You will see the rays of the sun over Samaranus's head. Okay. Well, many of the icons that we'll see in the Catholic Church, you will see the rays of the sun out of there. And that's where this stuff is coming from. Likewise, if you go to uh, Rome and, and places like that, uh, Athens, you'll see the, the Parthenon and the Pantheon. Many of the Greek gods will see Jupiter was one of them. Jupiter was taken down, that statue, and Constantine took those things and Christianized them and then basically made them things uh, like Moses and uh, whatnot. If you go into the Vatican today, Moses will be seen and he has horns. Okay, It looks like the devil. Well, that was a Greek god, a Roman god, I should say. And what happened is the church just took all of these pagan things, Christianized them, and put them there. Well, ultimately, I think that's what happened here. That's 
some history of what's going on here. That wasn't, you know, new. What has been done will be done again. In Elijah's day, they began worshiping other gods. How it, you know, exactly got started, I don't know, but Baal was one of those gods. And um, Baal worship was big. And as he said, there were 450 prophets that Elijah had called up here to um, decide which one of these is really God. Is it, you know, your God, Baal, or is it Yahweh, ultimately? Well, as the story goes, and I can read some of that here for you. Um, let me get to that real quick. It's uh, coming from chapter 18 of 1 Kings, and I'll just start reading here in verse uh, 20. Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together under Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near unto all the people and said, How long will you go limping between the two sides? Okay. If Jehovah be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of Jehovah. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces. Lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of Jehovah. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. And they took the bowl which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered. They leaped about the altar which was made, and they came to pass at noon. Elijah mocked them and said, Cry louder, for he is God, if he is God, either he is musing, or he's gone aside, or maybe he's on a journey, or maybe he sleeps, needs to be waked up. They cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances, which is basically what we see many of the pagan worshipers and the Satan worshipers would do. They cut themselves to offer their blood, that type of thing. And he says, it was so that after the blood gushed out, it was so when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. I find it interesting that Elijah waited for that time of the evening sacrifice, because there was only certain times that that was supposed to be done as well. Well, he goes on, Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near. And he repaired the altar of Jehovah that was thrown or torn down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of Jehovah came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of Jehovah, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four jars with water, and pour it on the burnt offering, and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. They did it a second time. Do it a third time. And they did it. The water ran about down the altar, and he filled the trench with water. It came to pass at the time of the offering, at the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Jehovah, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Jehovah, hear me, that this people may know that thou, Jehovah, art God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then. The fire of Jehovah fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And so that is what he showed us down below the brook. And I'll have him kind of point out different directions here in a moment as well as far as what you can see from here. But a few things I want you to understand. Again, the miracles of God 
Fire came down from heaven. In the tabernacle, there was always fire that came down. They never lit that fire themselves to offer a sacrifice to God in the tabernacle. And Elijah wasn't about to do it then either. That would have been wrong. And so it was fire from the Lord that came down to consume that. But notice it didn't just consume the offering. It consumed the rocks, the dust, the water. We might have a chance, as I said, to, to see some places uh, at what may be Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's one of the things they talked about. Even the rocks were consumed from the power of God. And it was a miracle. We could try and logically explain this away, but there is no logic that you can explain for this fire to come out of heaven and consume a little altar in the burnt offering. This is a miracle because our God is a God of miracles. And that is exactly what happened somewhere here on this mountain. Again, we can't say that it was right here, but somewhere on this mountain, there was fire that came down from heaven that could have, I'm sure, been seen for miles that licked up that fire. Because these people somewhere in their line had started worshiping false gods, Baal worship. And as sad as it is to say, I think that that's what's happened in the church today is we have become a church that is filled with idol worship. It's filled with um, superstitions and traditions that aren't even biblical. And uh, I think that if Elijah were here today, he would probably say many of the same things to the church today. You guys decide who is God. Uh, is it this pastor that's the head of this church or I is it God himself? Is it a leader? Is it some icon or is it God himself? And you know what happened after that fire came down? They said, Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. Ultimately, they were saying Elijah, Elijah, because that's really kind of what Elijah's name means is the Lord is God. And so it's kind of interesting how he would have been, in some senses, uh, God honored him in that way, too. And as the story goes, after they kill them, there's all kinds of other things we'll see about the, the water coming up and, and whatnot from other prophets. Uh, uh, the water coming up out of the sea uh, from the Mediterranean and, and running ahead to meet uh, Ahab all of these type of things that will happen after that. But uh, I encourage you to go tonight maybe in re your reading and continue reading on after 1 Kings 18 and see some of the things that happened and maybe try and put your place in a, uh, a, that Elijah must have been standing up against not only the king but all of the church system that had been established in that country. 450 prophets and he says, I'm the only one left. Okay, now, that wasn't necessarily true. God says, I have still reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. There were people hidden throughout. But Elijah was pretty much alone. And sometimes I think, especially for a church that's standing on the word of God, that it's going to seem like that. We're going to have to stand alone. And I want that, you know, in some quiet time that I want to give you here, I want you to think about that, the strength that Elijah had to go against the world and the worldly system that was out there. And just think about that. God has called us to do that, to stand against what the world is saying, but not just the world, but even what the churches are falling into today. Uh, I don't even know if we can call it Christianity in many cases. And we are called to say, no, he is God and he is God alone. We don't get truth from what some man says in their tradition. We're not going to need to go to take some spiritual journey to find that truth. The word is near you, it is in your heart. And we don't have to come to Israel to find it. That's not the point of this trip. But it's in our heart, and that's where we need to stand firm, is on that word. Because that's where the truth will be found, the word of God. So, yes, Jehovah, he is God, and nobody else. We, from here we're going for lunch, and after lunch we're going to Hamegedon, which this is the direction. There is Hamegedon, and it's a tail like this. You see this green tail with this circle on the top? Tell is artificial hill, which built by different layers in different periods. And we're talking about archaeology archaeology site. So the next stop will be this uh, tale of Armageddon. But this one is actually the same period and even younger. And this place called Yokneam. But why I brought you here, there was three directions, ancient time, that was used by different people who went uh, from different areas to different uh, places. And one of the guys was very, very famous was Thotmes, Pharaoh Thotmes III, was Egyptian king that in 15, 
70 BC defeated the Hyksos and why he did defeated these guys, the Hyksos, because these guys, the Hyksos, was another sect of people living in this area, used wagon with four wheels and the ox and donkeys were carry the uh, four wheels uh, wheel, um, um, four wheels wagon, and he himself invented another thing. He invented chariots of two wheels. Who is faster? The two, right? Two are having two horses in a hand, and they run. And Judea and the Maccabee also used the same chariots, guys. And when we talk about chariots, ancient time chariots was the armored units. Okay, these guys were the one, like the tank, to drive fast and to shoot. Okay, so this was the system ancient time. This guy was very faster, and this is how he defeated the Hyksos. And now what happened was, when he was on his way from Egypt, with this is a direction of Egypt, to go to Mesopotamia, he crossed this area, he conquered this place, and then what he did else, he went from here, after he conquered uh, Megiddo, he came up to this place. But what he did was, he did something very unique. This area, it's wide area to go through. The other area, when we be in Mount, in, uh, in the tail of Megiddo, it's also wide. And there in between, yesterday, the route that we took yesterday, where I showed you the mosque of these guys that uh, built the other mosque. Remember, it's Vadi Ara, it's called Vadi Ara. This Vadi was very narrow was very tough passage and very enough a very tough route to go through so he was smart he took his chief of staff and say what do you think our enemy will wait for us in Megiddo from if we come from Yoknam or if we come from the area of Jenin the other side or if we take the tough road so the chief of staff says of course that they'll wait for us in the wide route because they know that wide route is faster to come and take over the place he says you stupid I'm not taking the wide route I'm taking the tough the hard one because these guys won't think that we're gonna take the hard and the tough and the slow one they will wait for us at the at the faster one. So the faster one is one here, one there, and in between the two of them is the hard one. And he took the hard one, and then he came up and he conquered Jericho. After I mean, he conquered Tel uh, of uh, Megiddo after a few weeks and a few months. He took it over while he was coming from the tough wood and not from the faster one. And these guys were actually waiting for him at the faster one. And they were surprised that he was already there a few uh, weeks before these guys came back home and they saw him there. So that was uh, the tactic that this guy did uh, strategically to conquer this place. And he came from the direction of Egypt and Megiddo is there. So this is Tel of Yoknam, one of the ancient ones. And yesterday when we drove on the route number six, route number six is straight from here, and we looked at the three chimneys of Caesarea. You see the electric power station? Where the three chimneys. So next stop after Megiddo will be there. Let's go eat and we continue. John, can you take a picture of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah.
2,000 years, nobody take care of this plaster. So it was because of the sea corrosion, it's fall off the uh, wall like. So this is what we have today. We don't deal with this much. Only what we do is every once in a while we put cement because of earthquakes and things like this that it won't fall on the ground like. So look, there is no much cement on the arch. And in the very beginning, it was without cement, although the Romans were the first one to, to uh, invent cement. These guys were the first one. So what we have here is the theater. And look at the stone. Look at the stone on the uh, floor. This is the import. It's an import limestone from Turkey, from Antioquia. Herod the Great was bringing from Italy and from Antioquia, he was bringing beautiful marble stone. And this is from Antioquia, for example, when you see this type of stone is Antioquia and suddenly here you see this color and this and this and this and this and this and this, and this is Italy. <laughs> so you see he mixed, he mixed, this is local, this is Israeli, that's Israeli, this is from the area of Jerusalem. So we have Jerusalem, Antioquia, Italy. It's amazing. Now, all these eggs that you see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, okay? Called vomateria. Do you know what is the idea behind the word vomateria? When you guys are eating and you don't feel good, what do you do? You vomit. So the theater after the show vomits the people. <laughs> so this is why it's called vomateria. So the word vomit came out of the word Vo materia. Okay? So you learn something in the in English. So the arena, which is the stage, was right here. The performance, the guys that was giving the show was coming from there. Also Cornelius been baptized by uh, Saint Peter here. And it's Act 10. When we read Act 10, many of the stories of Caesarea we're talking uh, then. And uh, I want to show you another thing here. The nicest piece is the Corinthian, it's the acanthus flower. And this is what we talk about. These are Yonic and uh, Yonic and Doric. Yonic is the curly one, the two curls like, and that's the, Yonic, the Doric, which is simple, but the beautiful one is the Corinthian. And the Corinthian uh, kind of stone. What? Yeah, but where from? Antioquia, Turkey, Turkey. Because the color you see gray, gray color, gray and white mixed is from Turkey. And look at the Greek language. Look at the Greek, you see the letters. Shows you how during Roman period still we follow the language Greek and even the culture. So Greek arrived by uh, Alexander the Great, he was a young fellow, in the age of 18 he conquered the region of the whole region of the Middle East, starting from the area of Lebanon in the north, Israel, Syria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, India and Babylonia and Iraq of what is today. He did it in one year, I guarantee you today none of the army in the world can do it in one year of what this guy did. I mean. 2300 years back. It's amazing. His horses were screaming, leave us alone, let us rest. He was hyperactive. He was pushing his horses forward all the time. So you see that the language started then and ended by the Arab period. 
started in 332, ended by 638 AD. 332 BCE, 1000 years almost. Vamos. that said that Pontius Pilate even lived like the Bible said and then when they found this that just showed that the critics were wrong. the great he loved entertainment he loves life and he was building places for entertainment as a theater as an amphitheater and as hippodrome you guys know what the difference between theater amphitheater and hippodrome you don't know so I'll teach you come over here <laughs> first of all when you enter the place when you enter the place which is the hippodrome you need to use restroom where is the restroom guys Take a seat here, and you see the line here? This is where the dirt, I mean the liquid goes, and goes down there and continue to the sewers. So this was a restroom, that was a toilet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, John. I walked in so I could be right about a bathroom. What does that point out? Now you know why I took this thing. Yeah. What is this, guys? Theater. Okay, this is the arena. This is where the actors is performance. These are the entrance which is the raw materia, exit and entrance, right? Now, let's forget the, uh, no, let's leave it like this, okay, sorry. And, what is this now? Amphitheater. Why this is amphitheater? The word amphi is double, two. Two theaters is amphitheater. And everyone, you ask him, if I wouldn't draw the other piece, like the Colosseum in, uh, in Rome, if I wouldn't draw this piece, and I would ask you, what is this? You would say amphitheater. Am I right? It's wrong. Amphitheater is two theater touching one each other like. Okay? Just a second. What are we having now? Hippo drum. Hippos is a horse. Hippos is a horse. Hippos drum, a place, a racing place. The movie Ben Hur was uh, filmed at the place I showed you where the gate is. They took the picture there, they made the hippodrome there. And then they had the computer. Uh, later on, when they did the new piece, they do with the computer. But part of the uh, movie of Ben Hur was, was actually filmed here. So this is the center. And the horses have to make seven rounds. And the guy that will make, this is where the Caesar is sitting. Okay, in the center up there, and this is the hippodrome. So, where the guy that make after seven rounds, the first in across to the area of the Caesar is the winner. So this is hippodrome. Okay, so these are the three different 
uh, entertainment. Theater, amphitheater is double and a hippodrome. Let's go. Now, what you see here is something like this. Roman cities are actually imitated imitated the Greek as I said before. There was a guy named Hippodamus. You guys paid attention how uh, downtown New York is building, I mean with the crossroads. Remember this? Uh, what is the name of the downtown New York? Yeah, places like Manhattan. this. Manhattan. Manhattan. Manhattan system is actually imitating the Greek and later on the Roman. So Greek, what they did, they built White Street as the main street of the town. And then the neighborhood is in both sides of the town. And people come from the neighborhood on the narrow streets. So later on, it was called the Hippodamus system. The guy that invented it was named Hippodamus. But the Roman did another thing. Imitate the system and add to the system the water sewers and the water system and called the main street as Cardo. The word cardiology, heart, come from the word Cardo which is the heart of the town, the center of the town. And this small street coming from west, going east, because west is the sea. From, from west going east is Docomanos, and every three streets, it's the center of the cardo, which is Maximus, Maximus Docomanos. Okay, so now you understand the city system so let's go What we saw so far in this area, it's Roman period. Now in a second, as we forward, we jumped. Also this area is Roman and this is one of the Docomanos. And you see the Roman using stone for streets. It's not asphalt, it's not the other things, it's stones. And it's called Litos Stratos. Litos is a stone, stratos, streets. Streets made out of the stone. It's like the Gabbatine Jews in Jerusalem that mentioned that Jesus was trialed over the Litos Trasos, where the Gabbata, where the uh, pavement, where the pavement uh, streets. Remember this uh, part? I'll show you later, I'll tell you later of what, I, what I'm talking about. But anyway, the streets made out of stone. So it's Litos Stratos. And this is the Docomanos. This is one of them. That's one of the Docomanos. And here you have more of the uh, Roman ruins. And now we're jumping up and Okay, down there, down there, we've been at the year 63 BC to 324 AD. Now we jump with the years to 1099. Actually, it's 1101, two years after 
when Louis the Nine conquered this place and moved from here to Jerusalem. So this was the moat that he built to the crusader part of the city. He did not care for this part and he built himself inside this wall here. And now what was the idea of the moat? You see, it's difficult for enemy to climb up here and here another wall. And what did he do? He had water coming from the sea inside this canal surrounding the city. And then he lights fire over the water. He put oil, I mean, they spread oil over the water and lights fire over the oil and the enemy couldn't enter the town. That was the idea. So these are Crusader parts, 1101 AD. And he left back and forth when he went out of this area to different places. So he was using the Sabastus port. And uh, Act uh, 929 talk about the time that they wanted to kill him and then he asked, okay, I want to be trialed in, in Italy and not here, in Rome and not here. So he was using this port, all this area. 20 years ago was water here. In the last 20 years, we, the water were defeating, so we covered the whole area and we put all these things and we planted the grass. But it was a big mistake. We left only one part showing you what was the port of Caesarea. Now, this mosque here was built in 1840 by Bosnian guys, Muslim from Bosnia. You have fish in the water. It's a St. Peter. Look at the St. Peter fish. Guys, you see the St. Peter fish? It's tilapia. Uh -huh. The St. Peter fish calls also tilapia. If you guys like the fish, oh, tomorrow we can have a chance for... Uh, maybe tomorrow we'll have tilapia if you want. Tilapia. So this was the port named after Sebastus. One of his uh, best friends, Herod the Great best friends. And in the port, you see the line here, you see it was a line. So each low boat was entering here and was tied to the, uh, with the hook to uh, the stone underneath. There was a stone, one of them was very clear in the bushes, still there, but the, you can see it because of the bushes. So you see a stone sticking out of the water and have a big hole that with a rope, they tied the boat that the boat won't go into the water. So uh, you can't see it because of the bushes. No, so I... this was Port Sabastus, used by St. Paul many times. And of course the goods that go in here. And now when you look at this arch meeting in the center, you know that this is Crusader system that later on Mamluks imitate the Crusader and some places until today we have the Crusader uh, arches and it's original. Guys, this is original. It's 900 years old from 1101. And look here is the uh, Fleur de Lily. The Lily flower, Fleur de Lily in French. It's, what is this guy's name? Louis the Nine. Louis the Nine. He was uh, his emblem was the Fleur de Lily. Yeah. Fleur de Lily. Yeah. 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 And when we talk about the town of Megiddo, let's walk and talk. It's a town <laughs> that was, sorry, it's a town that was basically Canaanites, and it's even for uh, more than 6,000 years old. From today, you go backwards to the 4,000 BC. It was all kind of different people, basically Canaanites. What makes this place very popular is first of all this guy, Otmes the Third, that I meant that I meant that I mentioned before, 15th century BC, and later on is King David, and especially son of David Solomon, 
that made this city as his major base in the area of Jezreel Valley. And people that wanted to cross from Mesopotamia to Egypt or from Damascus, which is a note, to the area of Jerusalem, Megiddo was junction. We go left. Guys, you go left in the trail. So Megiddo was one of the major junc junction ancient time. Megiddo is over 22, it's between 22 to 25 layers. And what do I'm say when, I, when I'm saying layers means that each one that conquer the place, he destroyed the place during the fight. Then he take over, and when he take over, he rebuilt the place. Go left, left. He rebuilt the place in his in his architecture. I'm gonna you one and second. then is yeah. that the circle all right it. there? No, 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 no. It's up here. No, no, it's down there. The, uh, you're talking about the stage. Well, and yeah, altar, yeah. the old Canaanite altar. Yeah, the, the altar there. Okay. The Bama, it's called the stage, the Bama. Okay. Um, we're going to go there. That's okay. we. So here we have the Norton Palace and the Norton Stable Horses. And when we talk about the stables, these horses that were actually been here as a way, as a, as a, as a, as a military base. The town of Megiddo was most of the time military base to different people. If it was the Canaanites, if it was later on the Egyptian, or if it was later on the son of Israel. And King Solomon was the major person to make this city as the largest city, as a stronger city. And later on after him we had Ahab, later on we have Jeroboam, and all just all kinds of different uh, Israelites uh, kings all of them use this place as the major warehouse or major uh, horses and armored vehicles because in this place you had over thousands of uh, horses and chariots and from here they went to fight in everywhere and don't forget that all this area the Jezreel Valley down there and Elijah, we've been at Elijah place, he's up there on the hill, you see Mount Carmel guys? So you see the uh, building sticking up on the top place? Do you see where uh, the uh, Elijah altar is? So remember what happened, all this area been prophesied by Elijah and later on many of the Jewish king ruled this place. Okay. Then the place been neglected, say Roman time, Byzantine period, this place was not a very big deal. And uh, until today, this place as it is, and every once in a while when we have a good budget, we continue dig the place. For example, a guy named uh, Schumacher was, was discovering this part in 1903. A lady named Kenyon Catlin. Let's go forwards, just go to the stage and we continue. And Canaanites people will worship their gods by sacrifice babies, guys. Some of these guys sacrifice babies to their gods. One of the places to, to do the sacrifice was in this round altar. You see the round altar? And you see for the priest to climb up, you have a stairs. See the stairs coming from the bottom goes up. It was much higher, of course. And the altars of God never had those stairs going up like that because the priests were, they were not supposed to basically, it was supposed to be kept holy and otherwise they might expose themselves going up. And so that's one way of telling that's a Canaanite altar too, just among other things. But um, just you can think about how many babies were killed on that little circle altar down there. And um, it's just kind of, uh, normally if we had more time, we would talk a little bit about the, the tragedy of abortion going on in our country. Uh, we are worshiping the false god of, of humanism and selfishness and greed and, and doing whatever and killing babies, 
much like they did, just for slightly different reasons, but ultimately to, to benefit for ourselves. So when you look at that altar, you know, that should be a reminder for us to, to be vigilant and, and uh, uh, firm on the word and to stand up for the life of those that cannot fight for themselves and stand up against abortion. So I want that one to be ingrained in your mind uh, every time you think of that. Pray for all of those women who are having abortions and not only for those that, you know, not to have the abortions, but those who have the healing that it takes uh, for, I mean that the media lies to you about what that does to a woman and it, it does destroy them emotionally oftentimes and so uh, they need prayers you as see well. there are seven vile judgments that are being poured out those vile judgments that when the last one is poured out there are angels that are going to send out to prepare the way for these kings to come up and march against Israel to march up against God's people and they are going to be gathering in the Valley of Jezreel right here and it's called the Armageddon battle because it's this is a marker of that is typically what is believed and so this great final battle where the Lord is going to come out and fight because these people are marching up against Jerusalem they're marching up against you and, and what's going to happen is the battle is supposed to take place here okay guys this silo, this silo was contained the uh, seeds of wheat and stuff like this. And how do we know that this was a silo for uh, wheat seeds? We found many of the wheat seeds in this place. And look, this is 2,800 years old, 2,900 years old. It's the time of Jeroboam the second son of Yoash. And the year was a, uh, 850 something like this, 800 something that this guy built at the city of Megiddo the silo and it was covered on the top against train by uh, camel hair by uh, they need camel hair sheep hair and uh, goats they needed together and made a uh, vellum on the top to keep the uh, seeds not getting wet let's go guys here we have the sultan this is south this is north shows you how many horse settled they had in this place and it shows you that thousands of horses were in this place we're going to go now to the water shaft we're going to walk 183 steps and it's not an easy walk i don't want you to rush do it slow and carefully okay not not to rush because i don't want any accident in the end of the day in the beginning it's fine but not in the end does this mean like major room? It's raining, it's raining, it's raining, it's raining. Yeah, so I mean, is it, coming, is it, is it coming this way though? Okay, we're going to have uh, the uh, water, the water system, and it's about 183 steps. Look at this. Careful not to rush. Yeah, it's raining now. Who asked me about the rain? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't know if it was raining. Well, you it see that it goes like this, right, it's, it's raining. Like this way, or it's here. No, 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 it's heading this way, because look at this. Uh -huh. But we're going to be under the uh, hill now. When we come out, maybe it will catch us in the bus. But it's a, it's a second from the bus. Don't run, kiddos. We're not running.
So water was filled up this area, and these guys were throwing buckets. And were throwing buckets down there to the shop and lift up the water. All this area was water, okay? And this is how these guys kept the secret from their enemy. Each guy who conquered the place and enjoyed it, but after Ahab. So Ahab was something like 9th century BCE. But those who were Canaanites and all these guys who were before them did not enjoy this water system. Okay? Get that off camera, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm get together with you guys. Maybe we'll, tonight I know everybody's tired and I bet we always will be, but I'd like to share a little bit more in a more concise way than what I've been able to do on the bus and at these places because it was rush, rush. And I apologize for it being so rushed here today, but there was a little bit of miscommunication in the travel aspects that they thought that the Megiddo was going to close at 4 o'clock and finding out that it closed at 3 o'clock meant that we had to get to Caesarea quick so we had to push through things really fast. But I want you to let, wanted to let you know too that it, that's somewhat normal, not quite as fast as we did today, but that will be somewhat normal on some of these places because there's so much to see. And so our, our goal is to just 
whets your appetite, you're going to be able to see it, and I think I said this to some of you, when you get back is when this is going to be more important. Right now it's just numbing because you just are taking so much in and you see one thing after another. But when you get back and you start reading about these things, that's when it's really going to kind of set in a lot more. So if you're taking good notes and just highlighting some things, you know, just for you to remember, you'll never remember this otherwise. All What did we do on day one? You won't even remember three days from now what we did on the first day probably. So I encourage you to just also take notes if you're not doing that and just do some highlights of what, what we're seeing because it will jar your memory when, when you get back. Um, you may ask too, so why, uh, I did request a Jewish guide and there were a few reasons for that. One, I want to get some Jewish insight, which I think we got some right away at Canaan, um, seeing some of the insight, which is what I want to know. I want to see why do people not, what, what kind of logic is going through their minds. And I, I think that what we do see is it's not logical that, um, you know, and it's okay for, for others to disagree with us and to have those different opinions, but the bottom line is, to me, it does not seem logical at all that we can pour wine in, you know, and yeah, I believe it will come out a little bit redder, but that's not what the Bible says. And so we can see how ultimately illogical it is, and to me, it supports my faith even more to be able to see, wow, you know, they really don't have anything. It's kind of the same thing when I do a debate on evolution. I go there and, and I get to see, I used to be scared going to these debates thinking, what if they bring up some great scientific information that I'm not aware of yet? And what ha ends up happening all the time is they bring this stuff up and I walk away thinking, wow, they really don't have anything. And it's kind of exciting for me to see, wow, I'm on the right side. And I think the same thing happens with Christianity when we can see some opposing views and uh, that's kind of why we requested that. Uh, I did request a, well, I don't need to get into all that right now. I, Jewish, Christian, but aren't any that they could find or had in their outfit. So I chose to go with this anyway. Um, it means you are going to probably have to require, you know, to look at those scripture verses that I gave you. And I'd encourage you to do that tonight to get in a little bit deeper to some of these sites that we're going to. Even when we had a Christian guide before, we don't get much more than what we're getting with him. But I just thought it was running through my mind today. I hope that some of you guys are thinking, man, we're not. You're going to get history. You're going to get the facts more so than you're going to be able to get the spiritual aspect. I was hoping to have a little bit more time to give that myself. And I just don't think I'm going to have as much time to present what I was hoping to present to you. And so it does mean you'll have to do a little bit more of that. And then maybe when we get home, or a good majority of you, we can get together a few evenings and uh, do more of a presentation form and put some of these things together. But otherwise, I'm going to try and give you guys a little bit of that homework to, to look at those scripture verses of the place we're going, look those up and see what happened historically here and I'll do the best I can to give you what I can in those places. But I don't want to make it rush, rush all the time either, so uh, I'll have to probably shorten up some of my things. We will try and get you a camel ride uh, when we get to Jericho the day after tomorrow in that area. Um, so those of you who wanted the camel ride, there have been a few things that have changed. Uh, for example, Jericho, we will have to have a different bus driver and a different tour guide, maybe a different bus driver anyway, because he's not allowed in. That is Palestinian. And um, so again, because of the conflicts that are there, there are certain places they just they can't go into. So um, there will be some issues like that that we'll deal with too. I don't know all the details on it. Um, last night we did go through the ag agenda with him to try and get everything lined up. It, when we're in Jerusalem, you will have a little bit more time to have your pace to do what you want. We've got really two free days that we'll be able to do. So when we're in Jerusalem, I want you to kind of keep note of where you're at as much as you can and say, oh man, I want to go see this when we get back. And I will also try and give you some other ideas of what you can see on your days off and then you can do it at your own pace and it'll be a little bit slower. So it won't all be like today. Tomorrow will be another busy day, but it shouldn't be quite as busy as was it, as what it was here today. So, but I did warn you, it's gonna be tiring, so.
any questions or any thoughts or anything that anybody has?